everybody. Welcome back to Based. We're at episode eight, and this might just be our last episode on the OG set of Based, and that is because I am moving this week. I just bought my first house. I'm super excited, also super stressed. People keep saying, congratulations, and I'm like, thank you. But what you really should say to first-time homebuyers is, are you okay? Because it is a very, very stressful process. I have been spending a lot of time on my knees, a lot of time in the fetal position and leaning very heavily on my family. Um, but I am excited as a whole and I'm also very sad to be leaving my family. I've been spending the past couple of months as a COVID refugee in South Carolina with them. I fled New York City last year when the pandemic first hit and I have just had the best time. You know, people used to always make fun of millennials when they would move home and stay with their parents. But I gotta say, like, I would leave this place a five-star review. It has been awesome. My dad makes me breakfast in the mornings. My mom cooks me dinner at night. I get to hang out with them all the time. It's just lovely. I've had a really wonderful time I'm going to miss them a lot. I tried to convince my family to like form of those family compound kind of things. You know, everybody sort of move into like houses on the same property, but nobody's taking the bait, which I think is weird. We are like, I was raised Southern Baptist. I was homeschooled. Like this homesteading thing should be right up their alley. I'm surprised that no one's up for it. Anyways, I tried, so I will be moving a couple hours away. I'll still be close enough to visit, so that will be nice, but I will miss them a lot. Anyways, that all being said, based may look very different next month. I have to rebuild the set at my new place. We'll see how good I am at recreating it. We'll see how the lighting is. There's a lot of things to think about. So um, in the meantime, take one last look at the OG set. It has served me well. I love this little set. And anyways, on to the actual point of the episode. So today we are talking about American elections. The episode is called American Elections, Legally Rigged. Uh, this is an episode that I think might be overdue. I recently found out through a Facebook post I made that quite a few people in my base um, still believe the, the lie that the 2020 election was stolen. I knew there were still people out there that believed that. I didn't think there were so many in like the sort of liberty movement apparatus. I was surprised by that for reasons I want to touch on today. Um, but also, you know, I, I think it's important to just do a comprehensive episode on elections because not only do you have the 2020 conspiracy out there, you also had Democrats with their own conspiracy in 2016 that I think it's important we discuss. Um, and ultimately, I think it's important we discuss because while I think both of those stories are fraudulent, I do think there are real problems in our elections. Our elections are messed up. Up. I have been mad about elections before 2020, before 2016, been mad about elections for a minute. The truth is that the people don't have that much say in our process as we're led to believe they are anyways. Um, and in reality, we have a system that is not serving everybody very well, it is unequal in many ways. And it is rigged, but it's done legally. It's all on the books. It's all right there in black and white. There's nothing conspiratorial about it. So I think that it's really important that we maybe take this opportunity where people are awake, they're recognizing their flaws in our election, and let's get down to the real root causes of that. That's the point of BASED, is, is really trying to get to the foundations and the root issues, and then we can hopefully come together and find solutions that work for people on both sides of the aisle. Uh, for wonks, for independents, for libertarians like myself, we've been keenly aware of these issues for some time. And that's because we really have been most impacted by these rules on the books. Uh, and we've been trying to sound the alarm, but the truth is that most Democrats and Republicans didn't really care until recently. And I think the reason for that is that the system was structured to protect their teams and <clears throat> parties. Uh, it was working for them. They didn't care that it was an equal or disadvantaged others. And it really wasn't until 2016 that one side sort of started waking up, and that was the Democrats. And they started to wake up because they were convinced at that time by many of their leaders and by the mainstream media that Russia was responsible for the loss of their nominee, Hillary Clinton. I want to be very clear. Hillary Clinton was, a response, was responsible for the loss of Hillary Clinton. She was one of the worst political candidates of all time. Nobody liked Hillary Clinton like this lady. I could do a whole episode on how much people hate the Clintons, but I'm not going to because this show is fun for me and that would be hell. I don't want to spend time researching the stupid Clintons. People hate them. She was not popular. She'd already lost the nominee nomination in 2008 when she was originally supposed to secure it. And the fact that they even thought it was a good idea to put her back up is just bonkers to me. 
Hillary was like this nominee that really served nobody's interest but her own in the military industrial complex. She was a say anything to be in power type. She still is. She was a squishy political robot who would change her political positions based on polling. She sucks. Like nobody likes her. Nobody was interested. Everybody kind of took a look at her and was like, no, thanks. And I get why, you know, this was hard to take. Losing to Donald Trump is bleak. It's pretty hard to put forth a nominee that is less likable than Donald Trump. But they did it, man. They found her and they caught her on the ballot. And and it went exactly as you would expect it to. Um, as a whole, this could have been a really good learning moment for the Democrats. You know, how did we get it this wrong? How did we miss the mark by this much? They could have taken that time to reevaluate, to grow, to try to move in a direction where their, their party was more representative of their actual public. But they didn't do that. Instead, they found this excuse, which was the Russia conspiracy theory. And I'm going to break that down in a minute. But it's important to note here that it's not surprising that they did this because people really hate to admit when they're wrong. It's very, very hard for the average person to change their mind. And it's like it's this fatal flaw in humanity that if you can overcome, you'll be way further ahead than 95% of the population because it's really important to be able to admit when you're wrong and change your mind. But they they didn't do that. It was a missed opportunity because of that. I think they're going to continue to become a worse and worse party because they missed that opportunity. And instead, they went down this really weird rabbit hole. So let's break down what happened in 2016. And Republicans, don't get up on your high horse or your high elephant because I'm coming back for you in 2020. Hold tight. All right, 2016. So nobody knew that 2016 was going to turn off turn out to be one of the weirdest election years of all time. It, it started off pretty normally. You had the primaries of 2015, and the energy was really on the side of Republicans. Uh, Obama had been in power for eight years. He'd been a pretty hostile president toward Republicans, um, just to remind people of a few things. You know, he labeled Republicans his enemies. He shut down dissent, saying elections have consequences. He shoved executive orders and regulations down the throats of Americans, ruling by the pen far more frequently than he was able to get legislation passed. He aggressively prosecuted whistleblowers and journalists. He asserted the right to drone U.S. citizens without a trial. He expanded the intelligence community and unconstitutional spying on citizens, and he unleashed his IRS department to target conservative nonprofits, just to name a few. Obviously, there was some bad blood there. Republicans really wanted to, like, get back at the Democrats. They felt like they'd been bullied and pushed down and disrespected for eight years. And, and so they, they really had a sort of a win-at-all-cost attitude. I remember that sentiment being expressed quite frequently. Um, and not only was the energy on the GOP side, so was history. Since 1972, every time one party has held the presidency for two terms, voters in the subsequent election have shifted towards the opposing party. On top of that, the GOP had a pretty solid slate of candidates. Uh, they had 50, or sorry, they had 17 total. The spread uh, contained 10 former or would-be governors, four senators, a world-renowned surgeon, a Fortune Top 20 CEO, and one reality star. <laughs> Uh, on the Democrat side, you had far less energy, far fewer people, and that's because the field had been cleared for Miss Hillary Clinton. Now, if you're not in politics, you might not be aware that this happens, or you might sort of see some of the signs of it happening but not totally understand what's going on. But there is often an unspoken agreement in parties about whose turn it will be to run for open office, and it happens in presidential elections all the way down to alderman elections at the local level. And when it's somebody's turn, what you'll see is most other credible candidates set the election out. You know, they're waiting for appointments, cabinet positions in exchange for doing this. And hopefully they're thinking down the road, it will then be their turn. Um, and so this is this is pretty common in, in the system. Political junkies often call it the invisible primary. Uh, Vox writer Andrew Prokop, hope I said that right, he describes it as the attempts by important elements of each major party mainly elites and interest groups, to anoint a presidential nominee before the voting even begins. These insider deliberations take place in private conversations with each other and with the potential candidate, and eventually in public declarations of who they're choosing to endorse, donate to, or work for. And in 2015, this worked. Most funders and grass tops, they lined up for Clinton early on, and they scared other contenders away. Prominent Democrats like Senator Elizabeth Warren and Vice President Joe Biden, they declined to run. And it ended up just being Clinton, former governors Martin O'Malley and Lincoln Chafee, former Senator Jim Webb, a Harvard professor, and an older, lesser-known senator named Bernie Sanders. Uh, everyone but Sanders, Clinton, and O'Malley withdrew their nominations before the Iowa caucus, which is the first primary. 
Um, and that's kind of what was supposed to happen. You know, get your moment in the limelight, but you're going to pull out before the real competition starts and Hillary's going to get to run and really be out front. Uh, Martin O'Malley withdrew right after Iowa. But what didn't happen is Bernie didn't follow the plan. He ended up being very competitive in the early primaries, and he refused to drop out. Things started to really go left for the party at this point, and I mean that both metaphorically and literally. Bernie Sanders is an avowed socialist, and he's long been, that's kind of long been seen as an untouchable association in both parties, but he really began to take off, which was unexpected. Um, he was sort of this gadfly senator. He had no major legislation to his name. He actually had refused to join the Democratic Party, and Gallup didn't even include him in the polls. And so it was interesting that his campaign took off, but also it was a problem for the DNC, which stands for Democratic National Committee, because Sanders didn't need anything from the party or from Hillary Clinton. Um, he wasn't afraid of her ire. He wasn't trying to win consideration for a cabinet position. He wanted his message heard, and the Democratic primary was his vehicle to do that. So when he began to eclipse Clinton and the party, uh, her campaign was really able to, you know, have very few tools at its disposal in order to, like, pull him back in and get him to fall in line. His popularity was so weird to them. Um, it's why they didn't see it coming. He was, you know, old. He would not be somebody most would describe as particularly charismatic. He's, he's pretty, like, grumpy. And his views were super out of fashion, or so everybody all thought. Uh, but his message was catching on. His rallies began to grow, merchandise began to sell, all of the wind in, in it was really in his sails, and his campaign was just sort of off to the races before anybody could get a hold of it. It was kind of funny to watch from the outside because this was not supposed to happen. Clinton was furious. She had already had her momentum stolen by Obama in 2008, and now it's happening again because, hello, people don't like you. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, all that to say, the DNC starts to get really worried. Uh, so, you know, they know that these far left views might start to animate a portion of their base, but they're also keenly aware that a socialist in the general primary would get absolutely pummeled. On top of that, the DNC was beholden to, or rather on the payroll of, Clinton herself. In her book, Donna Brazile, the former interim chair of the party, claims Obama left the party $24 million in debt. 15 million in bank debt and more than 8 million owed to vendors after the 2012 campaign. And he had been paying that off very slowly. Obama's campaign was not scheduled to pay it off until 2016. Uh, the Hillary for America campaign and the Hillary Victory Fund, which was its joint fundraising vehicle, had taken care of 80% of the remaining debt in 2016, about 10 million, and had placed the party on an allowance. Uh, a joint fundraising agreement between the DNC, the Hillary Victory Fund, and Hillary for America stipulated that in exchange for raising money and investing in the DNC, Hillary would control the party's finances, strategy, and all of the money raised. Her campaign had the right of refusal of who would be the party communications director, and it would make final decisions on all other staff. The DNC also was required to consult with the campaign about all other staffing, budgeting, data analytics, and mailings. Now... It would be normal for some of this to take place if you had an incumbent who was running or once a candidate had secured the nomination. At that point, it would be pretty standard for the party to sort of fall under their control. But what's notable is that according to Donna Brazil, this agreement was signed on August 20, in August of 2015, which was just four months after Hillary announced her candidacy and nearly a year before she officially had the nomination. So, due to a lot of these things, people began to believe the DNC had rigged the primaries against Bernie and for Hillary, and these financial arrangements that came out later, uh, while they weren't illegal, they bolstered these claims, and so did other leaked information about the party's operations. Top Democrats essentially dismissed Sanders as a viable candidate during the primaries. They attempted to undermine him with voters and even took steps to derail his campaign, according to hacked emails of theirs that were made public by WikiLeaks. Wondering if there's a good Bernie narrative for a story, which is that Bernie never had his act together, that his campaign was a mess, wrote DNC Deputy Communications Director Mark Pashubach to DNC Communications Director Luis Miranda. And this was in response to backlash over the DNC Chair Debbie Wasserman Schultz uh, shutting off the Sanders campaign access to voter database files. So th that's just one example of an email that was leaked. There were many others that came out in this vein that clearly showed people high up in the party were working to diminish uh, and put down the Bernie campaign and to bolster Hillary's campaign, which is just not something most people thought that the party should do. They thought that, you know, we have an open primary, the party should be uh, unbiased and support all nominees until the voters pick the candidate. But that's not really what happens. 
Uh, the Ridleys also provided further evidence that the DNC broke its own charter violations by favoring Clinton as a Democratic presidential nominee long before any votes were cast. Now, Sanders' whole message was that the powerful and connected were rigging the systems of wealth and influence against the powerless. And here in the Democrat Party was one example. You know, look at how few of the debates there were. Look at the emails in which DNC staffers clearly preferred Clinton. Look at Clinton's endorsements, her money, her machine. You know, he was saying, does this look fair to you? Does this feel fair to you? And the answer was no for most people. Even for people watching on the right wing side of the aisle, most people saw what went down and recognized that the DNC had meddled in its own primary process to essentially make sure Hillary got the nomination. And that wasn't something that the vast majority of people thought parties did or should do or that they even could do. Now, none of this amounts to rigging, necessarily, or even anything particularly unusual. Brazil, for one, notes that she also worked to clear the field when she managed Gore's 2000 campaign. That's just politics, she says. There's nothing wrong with that. But all of this led to a primary in which Democrat voters had very few choices. They had very few opportunities to hear from the choices they did have, and people felt like something was wrong in the process. In reality, most were actually just paying attention to the process in the first place, because for those of us who've worked close to politics for some time, we've seen these things going down behind the scenes. It's that the average voter just hasn't been really paying that close of attention. Ultimately, Clinton prevailed in the primaries with a lot of assist. And once Trump secured the GOP nomination on the other side, Democrats thought they had this in the bag. Uh, all polls sh showed that she was well in the lead, and in response, Hillary barely campaigned. She didn't even go to some states. Uh, in short, she was a very arrogant candidate, but perhaps the ordained path to the nomination her party had laid out for her led her to believe that her victory was inevitable. She certainly didn't think she was going to lose. Um, and, and, you know, throughout the remaining months, she struggled to bring Bernie's wing into her coalition, and the scandals around the DNC's meddling in its primary kind of left a bad taste in the mouths of many. So you had sort of a fractured Democrat base going into the actual election of 2016. Um, but when Hillary lost to Trump, the story from the DNC and the mainstream media quickly began to center around a very different narrative, uh, which also distracted from the DNC's own scandal, notably. And the narrative went like this. Donald Trump conspired with Russia over the 2016 election. He's an agent of the Russian government, along with many of his associates. Russia was able to influence the election through social media bots. Additionally, computer hackers affiliated with the Russian military intelligence service infiltrated information systems of the Democratic National Committee, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, and Clinton campaign officials, notably Chairman John Podesta, and publicly released stolen files and emails through DC Leaks, Goosefire 2.0, and WikiLeaks during the election campaign. A lot of allegations there. In response to these allegations, the Mueller investigation was formed, and this was an investigation of Russia interfer interference in the 2016 United States elections. They were looking at links between associates of Donald Trump and Russian officials and possible obstruction of justice by Trump. Um, and this took place from May 2017 to March 2019. Mueller's final report on his nearly two-year-long investigation into Russian election interference did not find evidence that Trump's campaign coordinated with Russia. Mueller charged no Americans with election conspiracy crimes. With regard to Facebook ads and Twitter posts from the Russia-based Internet Research Agency, Mueller wrote, the investigation did not identify evidence that any U.S. persons knowingly or intentionally coordinated with the IRA's interference operation. The report goes on like this. I've actually linked a breakdown of the findings in my show notes, which you can always find at my Substack for each episode, or you can just go read the report yourself. Um, but it, it, it continues to go on like this, and it, it pretty much um, exonerated everybody accused in this whole process. And the investigation was really a major L for Democrats, and yet to this day, they refuse to acknowledge it, um, and they continue to push the Russia conspiracy theory. Glenn Greenwald, who is a progressive journalist, said the following. In the Mueller report, in one section after the next, they said either they couldn't establish that or there was no evidence for it, and yet they're acting as though it said exactly the opposite, that this conspiracy theory was demonstrated and proven and vindicated. They're living in some bizarre fantasy land because they're worried that admitting that they got the story wrong will damage their credibility. And it would, and it does, but it, it damages their credibility more that they continue to push it. It's crazy to me to watch. They, there's no evidence to support any of these allegations. Democrats continue to use this conspiracy to push for regulation on social media companies and to claim the 2016 election was stolen. They've also used it to deflect from the real scandal of 2016, which I continue to think was their own party's primary process. And that's where we will circle our attention back to shortly. But first, we must come back to our friends in the Republican Party and their own election 
awakening, we'll say. Unlike 2016, we all knew the 2020 election was going to be a dumpster fire. <laughs> I mean, how could it not? You had COVID that had swept the planet. We'd all spent the year locked in our homes. Uh, the hottest fire economy had been brought to a standstill thanks to really stupid government policies. And most of the election was going to take place on our TVs rather than in person uh, at campaign events like it usually would. On top of that, we knew it would be really divisive. Uh, I'm one of the few people who got to experience the 2020 election in both a blue state and a red state. I was in New York City until May of 2020, and then I was in South Carolina for the rest of the year. And here in Trump County, Republicans thought Trump had it in the back. Everyone they knew was voting for him. They had these like really large boat parades all last summer. I remember I went down the lake one day, and, and it was going like this. The dock was swinging, and I was like, what is happening? And it was this huge long line of boats going down the water, all flying Trump flags. They had, you know, Trump blow up dolls. It was bizarre. <laughs> and that was happening all over the South, you know, so they saw these kind of events going down. They saw how many people were showing up for uh, Trump rallies as opposed to other people's. The energy just seemed to be in his favor and, and, and they really couldn't understand how much other parts of the country hated him. Uh, and, and they really, you know, I couldn't help people see like the very big differences in the ways that Democrats and, re and Republicans were responding to COVID as well. That was another thing that I just totally black and white experience going from New York City to South Carolina. Um, and I think that people were unable to take those dynamics into account. So because of that, um, they really believed Trump was going to win down here. And, and they just couldn't fathom a way that that wouldn't be possible. Um, I thought Trump was probably going to lose from probably about the George Floyd protest on. Um, if I had had to put money on it, I wasn't certain, but that was sort of what I expected. But the the level most Republicans went into 2020 with was with this, this uh, inability to fail kind of mentality. So heading 2020, um, that's, that's where their minds were at. Democrats and many independents sort of had the same, you know, we must win at all costs attitude that Republicans had gone in with in 2016. Uh, during the primaries, voters often express eagerness to rally behind whatever candidate could win. I remember the New York Times Daily Podcast interviewing people after uh, each debate, and they'd say, I don't really care. You know, I kind of like this candidate, but whoever can beat Trump is who I'll get behind. Like, we just want to win. And so that was, that was the mentality on that side. Uh, it was a crowded field on the left. Many were worried it was taking too long for voters to sort of coalesce around a front runner. But that all changed in the South Carolina primary, where the black vote turned all the way out for Joe Biden. And they totally saved his campaign, which had been really struggling up until that point. Um, and that quickly pushed several other people out. You, you notice or you'll remember that many of the front runners are people who had been sort of at the top, quickly announced that they were ending their candidacy the day after Joe Biden won the South Carolina um, primary. And that's because the, the field was being cleared for him. Um, the party was not going to be caught sleeping this time around, and uh, they they were really trying to make sure they got somebody out front and center and, and got everybody behind him early on. Um, but, you know, the lockdowns and, and their own side's politics around the lockdowns made for some interesting obstacles. So to prepare for pandemic voting, uh, we saw a big push to expand mail-in voting. 29 states and the District of Columbia enacted 79 different bills to expand voting access in 2020. The majority of these bills expanded eligibility for and access to mail voting, while others address issues such as early voting, voter registration, polling place standards, and disability and language access. But even during a global pandemic, six states did enact laws that restricted voting access, so there was some pushback on the other side. Uh, while COVID provided some obstacles to campaigning, it also opened up some opportunities for the Biden campaign, and that's because Biden is a known gaffe machine. Like, the things... The things that come out of this man's mouth, I just, <laughs> I don't know how he's lasted in politics as long as he has. So COVID was a really great excuse to keep him inside and away from microphones and cameras and the general public. So that was a huge win for them. And that wouldn't have been possible in a normal election year. Uh, ultimately, Biden stomped Trump. He won by more than 7 million people in the popular vote and with 306 electoral votes compared to Trump's 232. And that's when things got even weirder. So I have to admit, I have egg on my face here because um, up until, you know, earlier this year, I was working around a lot of Democrats. I was doing criminal justice reform work. And I remember for years leading up to 2020, they would ask me, like, if Trump loses, do you think he'll refuse to leave the White House? And I would laugh. I thought they sounded ridiculous. I was like, yes, he'll leave the White House. Like, what choice would he have? Like, yeah, I don't know what you guys are talking about. Like, he'll leave. 
So, sorry guys, I just couldn't fathom what actually did go down. I still have a hard time believing that some of this went down and that so many people went along with it, but it did, and here's long and short of it. Uh, the Trump campaign claimed the election was stolen, and basically the entirety of the GOP backed him with no evidence. They misled millions of people. They made a lot of money off the scandal. They caused a riot at the Capitol that left five people dead. And to this day, much of their base truly believes this conspiracy, despite all, every bit of evidence to the contrary. And I don't want to go down a huge rabbit hole here because I swear I'll lose brain cells if I have to go Google QAnon. I'm not doing it. So you're getting the highlights. But Trump, you know, he began sowing these seeds of distrust around the security of the election months before it ever took place, you know, saying that he thought there'd be fraud. Democrats would do this. Democrats would do that. There'd be all these things that went down that, that somehow uh, explained his loss. You know, so he was already laying the groundwork before it ever happened. After the election, um, he kind of had this like conspiratorial explanation for every place he lost, which was a lot of places. In Georgia, he claimed there were suitcases of ballots that the state didn't verify signatures, that there was general mass cheating, military ballots went missing. He said there were dead voters in Michigan. There were fake voters in Nevada, whatever that is. Pennsylvania, he said, had more votes than voters. Detroit had more votes than voters. He said Biden's votes came from illegals. On and on it goes. The, the idea that such large-scale voting fraud could be coordinated and pulled off at a national level is just bonkers to me. Like, our government is so incompetent, they can barely deliver the mail, first and foremost. I mean, really, come on. And then on top of that, you think the Democrats did this? The Democrats can't get marijuana legalized. Something that, like, 90% of the population supports. These, these are not evil geniuses that are, like, somehow going to pull this off. Come on. It's, it's just, I don't know. You think they somehow snuck in, changed votes, stuffed in new ballots, registered dead people, stole military ballots across thousands of different precincts and counties, and there were no cracks, no leaks, n nothing that anybody could tangibly point to, nobody broke, nobody confessed. They pulled off the perfect crime. I I feel like, I'm sorry, I, like, I try to not talk down to people, but when I hear this story, I feel like I'm listening to a five-year-old tell me a story they made up. There are so many plot holes and, and just the grandeur of it all. I'm like, this is not a very good story. This doesn't make any sense. Furthermore, you think they did all this and then just didn't happen to grab a couple extra Senate seats they would need to actually get legislation passed when they stole the presidency? I don't, yeah. I, honestly, it's sad. I think this entire thing is sad. I think people are so uninformed about their own election process that they are very easily misled. I think that people know something's very wrong in their system and they can't put their finger on it because they aren't educated about their system. And so they are susceptible to sycophants and grifters that are out for their own gain. And that's exactly what the Trump administration and its allies were, you know, and boy, were these people gotten here. The Trump campaign and other supporters pushing the election fraud story, they raised 280 million off these claims in a few short months, much of it from small donors. These aren't rich people. Um, and ultimately they spent only 13 million of that on legal expenses, even pretending to fight the election results. And I say pretending because if you look at the lawsuits that were filed and the arguments that were made, they didn't even come close to alleging what Trump was alleging and what his supporters were saying on, on air um, or on Twitter. Um, the lawyers failed to, to make these arguments in any courtroom. Under questioning from judges in Arizona and Pennsylvania, Trump's lawyers backed away from actually asserting fraud. Despite Trump's allegations to the contrary, his lawyers acknowledge that they are not claiming that dead people voted or that occasional computer glitches were part of a deliberate conspiracy. In the Pennsylvania case, the attorney actually stated, Petitioners do not allege, and there is no evidence of, any fraud in connection with the challenged ballots. Petitioners do not allege, and there is no evidence of, any misconduct in connection with the challenged ballots. Petitioners do not allege, and there is no evidence of, any impropriety in connection with the challenged ballots. On and on it goes like this through every single claim. You see, the lawyers are actually constrained in what they can assert by three major restrictions that apply to lawyers. And those are professional ethics, rules of civil procedure, and rules of evidence. The election fraud conspiracy has been thoroughly debunked and never substantiated to begin with. The news outlets that furthered it are being credibly sued and will likely pay millions of dollars. The grifters who Trump surrounded himself with, like Rudy Giuliani and Sidney Powell, have lost all professional credibility and are facing lawsuits of their own. <laughs> Sidney Powell, facing her lawsuit, offered this as a defense. No reasonable person would believe her election lies. 
That's documented. That's actually in a court document that she wrote that. Or her lawyers wrote it. There will be no responsibility taken by the people who spread this lie, least of all Trump. No money is going to be returned. The record will not be set straight. And the party is now hard at work to make it harder for Americans to vote the next time around. Both Democrats and Republicans now believe their elections are fraudulent, rigged, undemocratic, and that the only reason their side lost was due to manipulation. In reality, both lost because they put forth atrocious nominees that no God-fearing person could vote for. But these conspiracies keep people from having that reckoning. And there's a bigger, more important reckoning these lies keep people from having as well. And that is the reckoning over their own side's complicity in making our elections unfair and undemocratic. Notice in both the Russia and Trump conspiracies, it is only the other side that is corrupt, never their own team. Voters are correct in smelling smoke around our elections, but they aren't following the signal to the fire. The truth is that the system is rigged and has been for decades, but it's all carried out in legal, on-the-books methods. You sense that your voice doesn't matter all that much in the process, if you feel your choices are manipulated, if you feel like you vote and you vote and you vote, but somehow you always end up with John McCain, as Tom Wood said, you're right. I don't like conspiracies because I don't like to see people misled, and in this case, I think the conspiracies spread by the left and the right prevent us from addressing real problems in our system, further tribalism, and they increase animosity and social distrust, which ultimately prevents people from paying attention to the real problems. Thank God we have based, because that is the point of this podcast. I want to get down to the root of the real problems so we can come together and address our real common enemies, which I promise you, I promise you, are the parties themselves. The best place to start here is always the beginning, which is something I hope you've learned from this podcast so far. So I want to go back to 1776, which is the birth of America. Most of the founders did not intend for the country to have um, political parties in the first place, and they really hoped that they could avoid partisanship altogether. In 1787, when delegates to the constitutional, constitutional, con- I can't speak today. In 1787, when delegates to the Constitutional Convention gathered in Philadelphia to hash out the foundations of our new government, they entirely omitted political parties from the nation's founding document. Many of them saw parties or factions, as they called them, as corrupt relics of the monarchical British system, which they wanted to discard. George Washington's family had fled England precisely to avoid the Civil Wars there, while Alexander Hamilton once called political parties the most fatal disease of popular governments. James Madison, who worked with Hamilton to defend the new constitution to the public and the Federalist Papers, wrote in Federalist Number 10 that one of the functions of a well-constructed union should be its tendency to break and control the violence of faction. Jefferson stood out in disagreement alone, writing, men by their constitutions are naturally divided into two parties. Now, George Washington put both Hamilton and Jefferson in his cabinet, and for the next couple of decades, the two kind of duped it out, and they had very competing visions for the country. Their dispute eventually resulted in the birth of the nation's first two political parties. But before I get to those, I do want to note that in his parting address, Washington wrote the following. Let me now take a more comprehensive view and warn you in the most solemn manner against the baneful effects of the spirit of party generally. This spirit, unfortunately, is inseparable from our nature, having its root in the strongest passions of the human mind. It serves always to distract the public councils and enfeeble the public administration, It agitates the community with ill-founded jealousies and false alarms. It kindles the animosity of one part against another, ferments occasionally riot and insurrection. It opens the door to foreign influence and corruption, which find a facilitated access to the government itself through the channels of party passions. Thus, the policy and the will of one country are subjected to the policy and will of another. You should read his whole address. There's um, a lot more on this subject and a lot more just really incredible words of wisdom. I've linked it in my notes. Um, It's one of my favorite speeches in history, but uh, George Washington knew what's up. (laughs) He knew that parties were problematic, but his warnings were not heeded, and the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, which then became the Democratic Republicans, were born shortly thereafter. These two parties were dominant for a really short period of time. Um, By the time Andrew Jackson's elected, the Republican Party had split into a Jacksonian faction, which became the modern Democratic Party, and that was in the 1830s, and then the Henry Clay faction, which was absorbed by the Whig Party. Um, The Whig Party collapsed in 1854, and from its ashes, the modern Republican Party was born, and thus we ended up with the Democrats and Republicans. Initially, the laws blatantly excluded most people in the country from voting, so the parties weren't really needed for that. Only white men who owned property and who were over 21 could vote. 
Um, and then the laws were really left to the states uh, to determine how to, to structure that. And so for the next several decades, you saw this basic, um, these basic categories stand for who could vote. And then you saw some states start to change that slowly, but they mostly continued um, with some exceptions. In 1856, North Carolina did become the last state to abolish the property ownership requirement. In 1868, citizenship was guaranteed to all male persons born or naturalized in the U.S. by the 14th Amendment, and that set the stage for future uh, expansions for voting rights. In 1870, the 15th Amendment prevents states from denying the right to vote on the grounds of race, color, or previous condition of servitude, though we do still, um, still see that Native Americans and the Chinese were discriminated against and blocked from voting for many decades. Uh, in 1920, the 19th Amendment is passed, which gave women the right to vote, though in practice, many of women, when, women of color are still blocked from voting. Because so few people could vote, the nomination process for political parties was mostly achieved through backroom deals for most of our country's history. Party delegates would cast votes based on their own whims, and the primaries were relatively unheard of until 1890. Uh, during the Progressive era, era, which lasted from 1890 to 1920, the people's desire for reform in the political process led to the establishment of primaries. With an eye to making the process of presidential nominations more democratic, progressive reform efforts focused initially on making the delegate and candidate selection processes more transparent and inclusive. One of the earliest efforts was made by Wisconsin Governor Robert La Follette, whose frustration with the backroom politics in the 1904 elections led him to draft legislation that allowed Wisconsin voters more say over their convention delegate selection. Subsequent states followed suit so that by 1916, 25 of the 48 states had presidential primaries and stricter rules binding delegates to popular election results. But after World War I, eight states actually abandoned their primaries in favor of the old tradition of allowing delegates to cast votes for the party's nomination. Following World War II, primaries made a resurgence with the advent of television and radio. Um, that allowed populist-minded candidates to get their message more directly to the voters and sort of cir circumvent the influence of party bosses. And this meant that lesser-known candidates stood a chance at prevailing in the state primaries over more senior candidates with greater clout among party insiders. This kind of came to a head at the Democratic National Convention in 1960, and this was, um, this was sort of the battleground between party elders and, and popular sentiment. You had JFK, John F. Kennedy Jr., who was up against Lyndon uh, Baines Johnson, Lyndon B. Johnson. JFK won, despite the party elite's concerns over his youth, um, but he offered LBJ the vice presidency as sort of a compromise. And this, this is where the tradition was really born of giving cabinet positions or other prestigious nominations to people in exchange for them backing away and letting somebody really have the spotlight. 1960 represented a turning point in convention history. No longer could party elites simply choose the nominees without the consent of the people. For the remainder of the 1960s, conventions tried to balance the declining influence of party leaders and the growing influence of the people. It's important to remember that political parties are private entities. That's right. I don't think most people know that. They are not publicly owned. They are private organizations, even though they are given millions of taxpayer dollars. And even though we pick up the bill for their primaries, these organizations are not ours. We don't have any control over them. And that means they get to operate based on their own rules, profit off the funds they raise, and ultimately have the final say in their nominee. And really, they don't have to answer the people all that much. You know, most of them in their charters and their conventions have some sort of uh, obligation for delegates to follow um, the primary votes of people, but ultimately they can do a lot to influence that and, and clearly work behind the scenes. And honestly, if they wanted to, they could just come in and change it. So that's where we stand with them. Now, it would not be in their interest to advertise these things, and so they are somewhat you know, beholden to the general public to keep up these appearances um, and keep the money coming in, but you know, they, they only minimally really have to care about what the people want. They have a lot of sway over who the nominee is. Um, so they're not going to, you know, completely disregard a primary vote, but they are going to be really crafty and work behind the strings to pull puppet strings uh, in ways that are less overt. And like we saw with Hillary versus Bernie, this can come in the form of marketing one candidate over another, courting donors and political operatives on behalf of some candidates, or spending resources disproportionately. And when they get really desperate, they can change their own internal rules to disadvantage a candidate, which brings me to 2012 and the candidacy of Ron Paul. Like Bernie Sanders, Ron Paul was the Republican revolution that was not supposed to be. Uh, he was older, he was anti-war at a time when neocons ruled the right, 
He was not a big name, and he'd really operated outside of the, like, in-click of the GOP for decades. Nobody saw this guy becoming, you know, the Ron Paul movement. They just, they had no clue. It really took them by surprise. Uh, and when it, his campaign took off, it threatened the anointed GOP nominee that year, which was Mitt Romney. And so the party started taking action to kneecap him. They used their credential committee to arbitrarily throw out a slew of Ron Paul delegates who had been dutifully nominated and sent to represent their states at the convention. Benjamin Ginsburg, Romney's legal guru and a national delegate from D.C., and his GOP establishment um, friends pushed through dramatic changes to the rules governing both the convention and the 2016 primaries, creating election dynamics and anti-establishment sentiment that many believe led to Trump's nomination and the party's inability to stop him four years later. I don't feel sorry for them. Uh, another thing they did was Rule 12, which let the RNC amend the rules in between national conventions. That meant that, defying precedent, party insiders could change how the 2016 primary worked without the approval of the Republican National Convention delegates. Thanks to Rule 12, in January 2014, the RNC condensed the primary schedule for certain states, magnifying the advantages of candidates with more resources and national media attention. A big travel budget, or for that matter, a private jet, allows richer candidates to compete for the popular vote in a dozen states at once while stretching grassroots competitors thin. These are just a few examples of how the parties can rig their processes. And we could stay here all day, but I don't want to because it's depressing. But the takeaway is this. You get to vote in a primary, but you're limited to two parties on the ballot in most states, and those parties reduce the options you have even further in a multitude of ways. The people aren't completely powerless in the process, but they face numerous obstacles that are intended to point them in the direction of voting for the candidate already selected for them by the private party. They're often unaware that they are even being guided in the process at all. Now, I said something really important just there. I hope you caught it. If not, I want to circle back. I said you're limited to two parties on the ballot in most states. If you're a voter, you know that. If you're not a voter, you probably know that. But have you ever asked why? Surely you don't think it's because Americans are just so happy with Democrats and Republicans. Because it's quite the contrary. In fact, Americans really dislike their options um, so much that most people don't vote at all. 38% say the two-party system is seriously broken. 40% want a third party even if they don't like the candidate. And only one in 10 adults think the two-party system works well. 80 million Americans did not vote last year. I've got to get on a high horse here. Growing up, I was always told that not voting was un-American, unpatriotic, that these people were lazy or ungrateful, they were not fulfilling their duty as citizens, and I just have to say, what a load of crap. Seriously, this system is a joke. It's a farce. We are constantly pre like presented with the worst of humanity we can possibly find and told to vote between these two options as if they're real options. It's the two parties are overrun with positions that violate human rights, they violate our constitution, they violate our independence, not voting is, is saving your conscience. It's refusing to condone what's being done in your name. It's refusing to participate in a corrupt system. It's being the lone man to stand up in a crowd and say, this is crazy, it must stop. You're not going to bulldoze me into voting for these heinous people. I won't do it. I just, I'm so sick of that attitude. And I'm really sick of the attitude on top of that, that the reason third parties can't win is because they're not popular. That's not it, Haas. It's not it. Don't think you've looked into this at all. When I can vote for someone who adheres to my principles and ethical values, I do. It's usually a libertarian candidate. But I do not always get that option. And it isn't because people don't like libertarians. It's not because the Democrats and Republicans are so popular. It's because they rigged the system to block third parties decades ago. We didn't end up with the two parties on accident, guys. Come on. Like, come on. Seriously. No, the reason third parties don't win elections is because the Democrats and Republicans have passed a ton of laws at the state levels. And again, there's nothing conspiratorial about this. It's codified. You can literally go and find these. I've linked a bunch of them in my, in my show notes. Um, so what does that look like in practice? If you aren't familiar with the fact that they do this, here are some examples. Uh, among the world's democracies, the U.S. has by far the worst ballot access situation. Each state writes its own ballot access laws, even for federal office. And sometimes these laws clearly are intentionally written to force one or two party domination. Since there is no single standard for the whole nation, the public and even the media are generally ignorant about ballot access laws and the ways that third parties are blocked. In some states, they'll require impossible numbers of signatures to get on the ballot for third parties while having much lower numbers for Democrats and Republicans. 
In Tennessee, it was something crazy, like 25 signatures to get on the ballot as a Democrat or a Republican, but you had to have 2.5% of the number that voted in the past governor's election, which was something like 56,000 signatures for third parties. And here's the really screwed up part. The Libertarian Party went and did it. I remember when I lived there, they started doing this huge ballot access drive. They had people out for an entire year, maybe even two years at festivals, fairs, any kind of public gathering there was. The Libertarians were there trying to get signatures, and they got the number they needed to get on the ballot. And then when they turned in the signatures, the Secretary of State's office arbitrarily threw them out, gave them no explanation, and said that they hadn't met the standard. This is how they play. They play dirty. It's so screwed up. And then on top of that, just to talk a little bit more about Tennessee, the Libertarians then went and tried to pass legislation to fix this and at least make it more equal to basically say that the standard should be the same for all parties to get on the ballot. And it started to move, but then the state legislature sent it to the Finance Committee, which is where bills go to die in Tennessee, and they stuck like a $1 million um, fiscal note on it, claiming that because they pay for the primaries of Republicans and Democrats, if this bill were to pass, they'd then have to pay for the primaries of other political parties. Why are we paying for their primaries? These are private organizations. It makes no sense. It makes absolutely no sense. And if we're going to do it for those two, why won't we do it for third parties? People have got to start holding these guys' feet to the fire. They do it because it blocks them from having competition. I saw another hearing out of Tennessee quite recently where somebody, one of their state legislatures, literally says, on camera, if we were to pass this kind of bill, it means we'd have more competition than our seats would be in danger. Yeah, they would be in danger because the Democrat and Republican Party suck and people are sick of them. This, this is the root cause problem in our system. This is a big, big deal. And for too long, people have been totally oblivious to it. Moving forward, other states won't recognize a third political party until they get a certain percent of the vote in previous elections, which is impossible when they can't get on the ballot to be in previous elections. It's a catch-22 by design. And then you have things like media blackouts and a lack of access to debates, and that prevents the general public from even being aware of other options that they have. Since the 1970s, the FEC has been in charge of making sure organizations that hold presidential debates and take corporate money to do so are nonpartisan. Those rules were last codified in 1995, and they demanded that debate organizations have objective criteria for determining what candidates qualify. But despite this, the FEC has a gaping exception for the Commission on Presidential Debates. This commission, which organizes every presidential debate that garners any attention, was explicitly set up to be bipartisan, not nonpartisan. It is run by Democrats and Republicans exclusively for the benefit of Democrats and Republicans, and the commission set up these requirements for debate entry that only Republicans and Democrats can get in. What are those requirements? A candidate must poll at 15% to get in. Notably, in the polls that counted in 2020 towards this, Libertarian Party nominee Joe Jorgensen was not even listed as an option much of the time. And the same thing happened to Jill Stein, who was the Green Party's nominee in 2016. It's unfathomable to me that people aren't aware of this, but um, they're just not paying that close of attention, I think, to their elections most of the time. Currently, the Libertarian Party is the only third party that has managed to overcome all of these hurdles and actually get 50 state ballot access for the presidential campaign. But it took decades, it took millions of dollars, and it's constantly in jeopardy. Um, on top of these things, you also have the campaign finance laws that Democrats and Republicans wrote that help them and hurt third parties. So essentially, the situation we're in is we're all forced to pay for the primaries of Republicans and Democrats while they work to block us from having actual representation. Cool. That's the real rigging. That's the real limiting of your choice. All of this has gone on for decades and hardly anyone has blinked an eye. And now they're up in arms over fraud. And I wanna be really clear, as a whole, our elections are really secure, but that doesn't mean they're fair. While fraud or attempts at fraud happen on a very small scale in every national election, it is excessively rare. It affects a minuscule percentage of all ballots cast and partly because election administration in the United States is decentralized down to the local level. It never occurs at a rate that would change the outcome of an election. Yes, there is human error, but it is usually discovered and corrected quite quickly. Yes, there are some attempts at fraud. There are 330 million people in this country, but it is usually discovered and corrected quite quickly. Uh, the most recent example was Bladen County in North Carolina in 2016. They found a Republican that had actually... Um, actually stolen the election and that was quickly discovered the race was thrown out they held a new election it's been solved um the latest uh, season of serial the podcast is actually about that if you want more information it's called the improvement association pretty good listen 
Um, but it just doesn't happen on anything but a small scale. Studies show Americans are more likely to be struck by lightning than they are to commit voter fraud. The Heritage Foundation's database identified 193 criminal convictions, civil, pen civil penalties, diversions, or other official findings for fraudulent use of mail ballots between 2000 and 2020. 193 for a period of 20 years. And that's a time period during which approximately 250 million mail ballots were cast. It's minuscule. As MIT election scholar Charles Stewart and National Vote at Home Institute CEO Amber McReynolds noted in an April op-ed, that puts the rate of mail ballots resulting in criminal convictions at a 0.0006%, and the rate of mail ballots resulting in any kind of official action at 0.00007%. So imagine my frustration when over the past four years, knowing everything I know about the system, I've had to watch people on both the right and left get mad over virtually non-existent fraud while missing all this other stuff that's going on over here and has been for decades that actually is rigging our elections and taking away the voice of the people. Not only that, but I've had to watch as the resulting actions from both the Democrats and Republicans have continued to diminish the voice of the average voter and make it harder for people to vote. The bigger problem is that in America is that people don't vote. It's not voting fraud. People don't show up to vote. It's that when they do show up to vote, they have so few choices and they're unlikely to have an option who will actually represent them. It's that they are forced to fund the primaries of parties they don't align with. And it's that they are manipulated and misled in the process more often than not. This is unsustainable. People will eventually revolt as they should. This can't go on like this. Few could argue that today in America, they have representation. We were supposed to have representation in exchange for taxation. I promise you, I do not have representation in Congress right now. I don't. The person up there voting does not align with my views. I've never been presented with the option to send somebody to Congress who did align with my views. It sucks. Uh, the major parties in this country are not the victim. They are the perpetrator, and I'm really tired of the Victim Act. I want to be clear, too, that... While I am more likely to vote for the Libertarian Party ticket, I don't see third parties as our hope. Um, that's not what I'm getting at. I don't think there are, like, salvation either. Even if, you know, a third party could overcome the rigging of our system and somehow become competitive, something that would take vast amounts of money and manpower, I believe they too would eventually become corrupted just as the Democrats and Republicans have. Parties serve themselves. They, they enrich their leadership they, this is their primary function. But on top of that, I also think they make people stupid. <laughs> Instead of paying attention to principles and policies and positions, parties allow people to outsource their critical thinking skills and research, and they make for a lazy populace that's consistently become easier and easier to fool, uh, that hardly notices when their parties fail to live up to the values they espouse, and that really only care to uphold uh, the other side. You know, they really don't care about accountability for their own side. It, it creates this team mentality that I think is uh, super damaging. I hate tribalism. I think it can be deadly in the worst of cases. And I think it makes people slow and stupid, even in the best of times. I think we should fight tribalism with every fiber of our being. Uh, the best solution I see for Americans is to push for things like ranked choice voting that actually get rid of the party system um, or make it far less important altogether. Uh, I might do a deep dive on ranked choice voting. I don't have time to today, but I think that that's one approach that could uh, help people begin to pay attention to the actual individual, their policies, their principles, their positions. It also would mean that third parties or um, more grassroots type candidates, people with less name recognition could be more competitive um, because you could vote for your first choice and then have a second choice. And that way you wouldn't feel like you were throwing away your vote if the third party or the lesser known candidate didn't win. So it, it kind of gets around some of the major problems in our system. So if you're interested in it, that's some homework you can look into. But for now, that's a wrap. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, be sure to share, like, review, leave a comment, tell a friend, help spread the word. Also remember, you can always check out my outline that has my notes and links at my Substack, which is hannahcox.substack.com. You can now also head to my website, ah, so cool, hannahdcox.com. That's Hannah, D as in Danielle, cox.com. Uh, and that has full show links as well as links to all my other content. And until next month, stay based.